Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, Chapter 11. Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, Over the Water, By and By. Old man coming down the line, whip in hand, beat me down, but I ain't gonna let him turn me around. The night whispered of a distant thunder. It was muggy, hot, a miserable night for sleeping. Twice I had awakened, hoping that it was time to be up, but each time the night had been total blackness, with no hint of a graying dawn. On the front porch, Mr. Morrison sat singing soft and low into the long night, chanting to the approaching thunder. He had been there since the house had darkened after church, watching and waiting as he had done every night since Papa had been injured. No one had ever explained why he watched and waited, but I knew it had to do with the Wallaces. Mr. Morrison's song faded, and I guessed he was on his way to the rear of the house. He would stay there for a while, walking on cat's feet through the quiet yard, then eventually returned to the front porch again. Unable to sleep, I resigned myself to await his return by counting states. Miss Crocker had a big thing about states, and I sometimes found that if I pretended she was naming them off, I could fall asleep. I decided to count the states geographically rather than alphabetically. That was more of a challenge. I had gotten as far west as the Dakotas when my silent recitation was disturbed by a tapping on the porch. I lay very still. Mr. Morrison never made a sound like that. There it is again. Cautiously, I climbed from the bed, careful not to awaken Big Ma, who was still snoring soundly, and crept to the door. I pressed my ear against the door and listened, then slipped the last furiously and darted outside. Boy, what are you doing here? I hissed. Hey, Cassie, would you keep it down? whispered TJ, invisible in the darkness. Then he tapped lightly on the boy's door again, calling softly, Hey, Stacy, come on and wake up, will ya? Let me in. The door swung open and TJ slipped inside. I pulled my own door closed and followed him. Uh, I'm in trouble, Stacy, he said. I mean, I'm really in trouble. There ain't nothing new, I remarked. What are you coming here for? whispered Stacy icily. Go get R.W. and Melvin to get you out of it. In the darkness, there was a low sob, and TJ, hardly sounding like TJ, mumbled, they the ones got me in it. Where's the bed? I gotta sit down. In the darkness, he groped for the bed, his feet dragging as if he could hardly lift them. I ain't no bed, I exclaimed as his hands fell on me. There was a deep sigh. Stacy clicked on the flashlight, and TJ found the bed sitting down slowly and holding his stomach as if he were hurt. What's the matter? Stacy asked, his voice wary. R.W. and Melvin, whispered TJ. They hurt me bad. He looked up, expecting sympathy. But our faces, grim behind the light Stacy held, showed no compassion. TJ's eyes dimmed. Then, undoing the buttons to his shirt, he pulled the shirt open and stared down at his stomach. I grimaced and shook my head at the sight. Lord, TJ, Stacy exclaimed in a whisper. What happened? TJ did not answer at first, staring in horror at the deep blue-black swelling of his stomach and chest. I think something's busted, he gasped finally. I heard something awful. Why'd they do it? asked Stacy. TJ looked up into the bright light. Help me, Stacy. Help me get home. I can't make it by myself. Tell me how come they did this to you. Cause, cause I said I was gonna tell what happened. Stacy and I looked at each other, then together leaned closer to TJ. Tell what, we asked. TJ gulped and leaned over, his head between his legs. I, I'm sick, Stacy. I gotta get home for my daddy wake up. He say I stay away from the house one more night. He gonna put me out and he mean it too. He put me out. I got no place to go. You got to help me. Tell us what happened. TJ began to cry. But they said they'd do worse to, than this if I ever told. Well, I ain't about to go nowhere unless I know what's happened, said Stacy with finality. TJ searched Stacy's face in the rim of ghostly light cast by the flashlight. Then he told his story. After he and the Simses left Great Faith, they went directly into Strawberry to get the pearl-handled pistol. But when they arrived at the mercantile, it was already closed. 
The Simses said there was no sense in coming back for the pistol. They would simply go in and take it. TJ was frightened at the thought, but the Simses assured him that there was no danger. If they were caught, they would simply say they needed the pistol that night, but intended to pay for it on Monday. In the storage room at the back of the store was a small open window through which a child, or a person as thin as TJ, could wiggle. After waiting almost an hour after the lights had gone out in the Barnett's living quarters on the second floor, TJ slipped through the window and opened the door, and the Simses entered, their faces masked with stockings and their hands gloved. TJ, now afraid that they had something else in mind, wanted to leave without the pistol, but RW had insisted that he have it. RW broke the lock of the gun case with an ax and gave TJ the much longed for gun. Then RW and Melvin went over to a wall cabinet and tried to break off the brass lock. After several unsuccessful minutes, RW swung the ax sharply against the lock and it gave. But as Melvin reached for the metal box inside, Mr. Barnett appeared on the stairs, a flashlight in his hand, his wife behind him. For a long moment, no one moved or said a word as Mr. Barnett shone the light directly on TJ, then on RW and Melvin, their faces darkened by the stockings. But when Mr. Barnett saw the cabinet lock busted, he flew into frenzied action, hopping madly down the stairs and trying to grab the metal box for Melvin. They struggled with Mr. Barnett getting the better of Melvin until R.W. whopped Mr. Barnett solidly on the head from behind with the flat of the ax, and Mr. Barnett slumped into a heap upon the floor as if dead. When Mrs. Barnett saw her husband fall, she dashed across the room and flailed into R.W. crying, you N-words done killed Jim Lee, you done killed him. R.W., trying to escape her grasp, slapped at her and she fell back, hitting her head against one of the stoves and did not move. Once they were outside, TJ wanted to come straight home, but the Simses said they had business to take care of and told him to wait in the back of the truck. When TJ objected and said he was gonna tell everybody it was RW and Melvin who had hurt the Barnetts unless they took him home, the two of them lit into him, beating him with savage blows until he could not stand, then flung him into the back of the truck and went down the street to the pool hall. TJ lay there for what he thought must have been an hour before crawling from the truck and starting home. About a mile outside town, he got a ride with a farmer headed for Smellings Creek by way of Soldier's Road. Not wanting to walk past the Sims's place for fear R.W. and Melvin had taken the Jackson Road home, he did not get out at the Jefferson Davis School Road intersection, but instead crossed Soldier's Bridge with the farmer and got out at the intersection beyond the bridge and walked around, coming from the west to our house. TJ, was, was them Barnett's dead? asked Stacy when TJ grew quiet. TJ shook his head. I don't know. They sure looked dead. Stacy, anybody find out? You know what they do to me? He stood up, his face grimacing with pain. Stacy, help me get home, he pleaded. I'm afraid to go there by myself. R.W. and Melvin might be waiting. You sure you ain't lying, TJ? I asked suspiciously. I swear everything I told y'all is the truth. I... I admit I lied about telling on your mama, but I ain't lying now. I ain't. Stacy thought a moment. Why don't you stay here tonight? Papa will tell your daddy what happened, and he won't put no, cried TJ, his eyes big with terror. Can't tell nobody. I gotta go. He headed for the door, holding his side. But before he could reach it, his legs gave way, and Stacy caught him and guided him back to the bed. I studied TJ closely under the light, sure that he was pulling out a fast one. But then he coughed and blood spurted from his mouth. His eyes glazed, his face paled, and I knew that this time TJ was not faking. You're bad hurt, Stacy said. Let me get Big Ma. She'll know what to do. TJ shook his head weakly. My mama, I'll just tell her them white boys beat me for no reason. She'll believe it. She'll take care of me. But you go waken your grandma and your daddy will be in it. Stacy, please, you my only friend. I ain't never really had no true friend but you. Stacy, I whispered, afraid of what he might do. As far back as I could remember, Stacy had felt a responsibility for TJ. I had never really understood why. Perhaps he felt that even a person as despicable as TJ needed someone he could call a friend. Or perhaps he sensed TJ's vulnerability better than TJ did himself. 
Stacy, you ain't going, are you? Stacy wet his lips, thinking. Then he looked at me. You go on back to get bed, Cassie. I'll be all right. Yeah, I know you're going to be all right, because I'm going to tell Papa, I cried, turning to dash for the other room. But Stacy reached into the darkness and caught me. Look, Cassie, it won't take me but 25 or 30 minutes to run down there and back. Really, it's all right. You as big a fool as he is then, I accused frantically. You don't owe him nothing, especially after what he'd done to Mama. Stacy released me. He's hurt bad, Cassie. I gotta get him home. He turned away from me and grabbed his pants. I stared after him, and then I said, well, you ain't going without me. If Stacy was going to be a fool and go running into the night to take an even bigger fool home, the least I could do was make sure he got back in one piece. Cassie, you can't go. Go where? Piped the little man, sitting up. Christopher John sat up, too, yawning sleepily. Is it morning? What are y'all doing up? Little man questioned. He blinked into the light and rubbed his eyes. TJ, that you? What are you doing here? Where are y'all going? Nowhere. I'm just going to walk TJ home, Stacy said. Now go on back to sleep. Little man jumped out of bed and pulled his clothes from the hanger where he had neatly hung them. I'm going too, he squealed. Not me, said Christopher John, lying back down again. While Stacy attempted to put little man back to bed, I checked the porch to make sure that Mr. Morrison wasn't around, then slipped back to my own room to change. When I emerged again, the boys were on the porch and Christopher John, his pants over his arm, was murmuring a strong protest against this middle of the night stroll. Stacy attempted to persuade both him and little man back inside, but little man would not budge. And Christopher John, as much as he protested, would not be left behind. Finally, Stacy gave up and, with TJ leaving, leaning heavily against him, hurried across the lawn. The rest of us followed. Once on the road, Christopher John struggled into his pants, and we became part of the night. Quiet, frightened, and wishing to just dump TJ on his front porch and get back to the safety of our own beds, we hastened along the invisible road, brightened only by the round of the flashlight. The thunder was creeping closer now, rolling angrily over the forest depths and bringing the light with the lightning with it as we emerged from the path into the deserted Avery yard. W wait till I get inside, will ya? requested TJ. Ain't nobody here, I said sourly. What'd you need us to wait for? Go on, TJ, said Stacy. We'll wait. Th thanks, y'all, TJ said. Then he limped to the side of the house and slipped awkwardly into his room through an open window. Come on. Let's get out of here, said Stacy, herding us back to the path. But as we neared the forest, little man turned. Hey, y'all, look over yonder. What's that? Beyond the Avery house, bright lights appeared far away on the road near the Granger mansion. For a breathless second, they lingered there, then plunged suddenly downward towards the Averys. The first set of lights was followed by a second, then a third, until there were half a dozen sets of headlights beaming over the trail. Well, What's happening? cried Christopher John. For what seemed an interminable wait, we stood watching those lights, drawing nearer and nearer before Stacy clicked off the flashlights and ordered us into the forest. Silently, we slipped into the brush and fell flat to the ground. Two pickups and four cars rattled into the yard, their lights focused like spotlights on the Avery front porch. Noisy, angry men leaped from the cars and surrounded the house. Caleb Wallace and his brother Thurston, his left arm hanging akimbo at his side, pounded the front door with their rifle butts. Yo, come on out of there, called Caleb. We want that thieving, murdering inward of y'alls. Stacy, I stammered, feeling the same nauseous fear I had felt when the nightmen had passed when Papa had come home shots and shot and broken. Wh what they gonna do? Uh, I don't know. Stacy whispered, and two more men joined the Wallaces at the door. Why, ain't, ain't that R.W. and Melvin? I exclaimed. What the devil are they doing? Stacy quickly muffled me with the palm of his hand as Melvin thrust himself against the door in an attempt to break it open, and R.W. smashed a window with his gun. At the side of the house, several men were climbing through the same window T.J. had entered only a few minutes before. Soon, the front door was flung open from the inside, and Mr. and Mrs. Avery were dragged savagely by their feet from the house. The Avery girls were thrown down through the open windows. 
The older girls, attempting to gather the younger children to them, were slapped back and spat upon. Then quiet, gentle Claude was hauled out, knocked to the ground and kicked. C Claude, whimpered Christopher John, trying to rise. But Stacy hushed him and held him down. W we gotta help, Stacy rasped, but none of us could move. I watched the world from outside myself. Then TJ emerged, dragged from the house on his knees. His face was bloody, and when he tried to speak, he cried with pain, mumbling his words as if his jaw were broken. Mr. Avery tried to rise to get him, but he was knocked back. Look what we got here, one of the men said, holding up a gun. That pearl-handled pistol from Jim Lee's store. Oh, Lord, Stacy groaned. Why didn't he get rid of that thing? TJ mumbled something we could not hear, and Caleb Wallace thundered, Stop lying, boy, because you in a whole lot of trouble. You was in there. Miss Barnett, when she come to and got help, said three black boys robbed their store and knocked her out and her husband. And R.W. and Melvin Sims seen you and them two other boys running from behind that store when they come in town to shoot some pool. But it was R.W. and Melvin. I started before Stacy clasped his hand over my mouth. Now, who was them other two? And now who was them other two? And where's that money y'all took? Whatever TJ's reply, it obviously was not what Caleb Wallace wanted to hear, for he pulled his leg back and kicked TJ's swollen stomach with such force that TJ emitted a cry of awful pain and fell prone upon the ground. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, cried Mrs. Avery wrenching herself free from the men who held her and rushing toward her son. Don't let him hurt my baby no more. Kill me, Lord, but not my child. But before she could reach TJ, she was caught by the arm and flung so ferociously against the house that she fell, dazed, and Mr. Avery, struggling to reach her, was helpless to save either her or TJ. Christopher John was sobbing distinctly now. Cassie, Stacy whispered, you take little man and Christopher John, and y'all, the headlights of two more cars appeared in the distance, and Stacy immediately hushed. One of the cars halted on the Granger Road, its lights beaming aimlessly into the blackness of the cotton fields. But the lead car came crazy and fast along the rutted trail toward the Avery house. And before it had rolled to a complete stop, Mr. Jameson leaped out. But once out of the car, he stood very still, surveying the scene. Then he stared at each of the men as if preparing to charge them in the courtroom and said softly, y'all decide to hold court out here tonight? There was an embarrassed silence. Then Caleb Wallace spoke up. Now, look here, Mr. Jameson. Don't you come messing in this thing. You do, warned Thurston hotly. We just likely to take care of ourselves and inward lover tonight too. An electric tenseness filled the air but Mr. Jameson's placid face was unchanged by the threat. Jim Lee Barnett and his wife are still alive. Y'all let the sheriff and me take the boy. Let the law decide whether or not he's guilty. Where's Hank? Someone asked. I don't see no law. That's him up at Harlan Granger's, Mr. Jameson said with a wave of his hand over his shoulder. He'll be down in a minute. Now leave the boy be. For my money, I say let's do it now, a voice cried. Ain't no need to waste good time and money trying no thieving inward. A crescendo of ugly hate rose from the men as the second car approached. They grew momentarily quiet as the sheriff stepped out. The sheriff looked uneasily at the crowd as if he would rather not be here at all. And then at Mr. Jameson. Where's Harlan? asked Mr. Jameson. The sheriff turned from Mr. Jameson to the crowd without answering him. Then he spoke to the men. Mr. Granger sent word by me that he ain't gonna stand for no hanging on his place. He says y'all touch one hair on that boy's head while on this land, he's gonna hold every man here responsible. The men took the news in grim silence. Then Caleb Wallace cried, then why don't we go somewhere else? I say what we ought to do is take him on down the road and take care of that big black giant of an N word at the same time. And why not that boy he's working for, too, yelled Thurston. Stacy, I gasped. Hush. A welling affirmation rose from the men. I got me three new ropes, exclaimed Caleb. New? 
How come you want to waste a new rope on an N-word? Asked Melvin Sims. Big as that one N-word is, an old one might break. There was chilling laughter, and the men moved towards their cars, dragging TJ with them. No, cried Mr. Jameson, rushing to shield TJ with his own body. Cassie, Stacy whispered hoarsely. Cassie, you got to get Papa now. Tell him what happened. I don't think Mr. Jameson can hold them. You come too. No, I'll wait here. I ain't going without you, I declared, afraid that he would do something stupid, like trying to rescue TJ alone. Look, Cassie, go on, will you please? Papa will know what to do. Somebody's got to stay here, in case they take TJ off into the woods somewhere. It'll be all right. Well, please, Cassie, trust me, will ya? I hesitated. You, you promise you won't go down there by yourself? Yeah, I promise. Just get Papa and Mr. Morrison for they, for they hurt him some more. He placed the unlit flashlight in my hand and pushed me up, clutching little man's hand. And I told him to grab Christopher Johns. And together, the three of us picked our way along the black path, afraid to turn on the flashlight for fear of its light being seen. Thunder crashed against the corners of the world and lightning split the sky as we reached the road. But we did not stop. We dared not. We had to reach Papa.